And good morning, church. Welcome to another Living Hope Today devotional. I'm so happy you're with me again today to study God's Word. You know, this is so pivotal in our lives. Uh, what does the Bible tell us? If you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. We're supposed to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. So by constant exposure to the truth that God has revealed to us in His Word, we can be changed. We can draw near to God. He's going to draw near to us. We mature as we continue to put ourselves in this steady, ongoing exposure to what God has said. I just praise God for you that you're here every day. You're willing to pursue him like this. I know God's going to bring the benefits of this to you as you pursue him. And by the way, today's passage has benefits talked about that are just unbelievable. I mean, it's so marvelous. It's so outrageous. It's, it's a shame to spend this little amount of time on this passage. I would invite you to read it over and over and, and just continue to absorb what's really being said here because it's phenomenal. It's absolutely wonderful what Jesus is telling his disciples. And along those lines, let me just refresh you. In John 14, we're in a place where Jesus is spending his last few hours with his disciples. He's about to go be arrested. He's about to be falsely accused. He's about to endure a mock trial and a scourging, leading all to being crucified on the cross. In these few hours he has left with his disciples, he's explaining to them many things. And by extension, he explains them to us as well. It's a phenomenal section of Scripture. John 13, 14, 15, 16, these are chapters that are found nowhere else. Uh, nothing like this is found in Scripture where Jesus is having this intimate instruction with his disciples face to face, and in this instance, for the last time, for the last time, at least face to face like this. So let's go to the passage. You know, there's one command that's constantly repeated in Scripture. It comes from Deuteronomy 6, 5. The New Testament reiterates this over and over again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. I mean, most people know this. This is a command of Scripture. We're to love God. But think about this, church. In modern culture, when you think about loving something, most of us think about emotion or, or some sort of feel-good uh, emotional response. We, we say we love peanut butter. Why? Well, we like it. We, we love that car. We, we love that restaurant. We, we love that program we watch. Uh, we love our dog. We love our spouse. Um, God's telling us to love him here with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Is he really telling us that the way we love God is through emotion, that we just are being called to feel good about him. We're, we're just being called to uh, have pleasant feelings and, and appreciate how grand he is. And it's about emotion. Well, something happens in John 14 that really clarifies this question for us. And let's go to it together. Let's look at it. Remember, we've already studied this. If you love me, in other words, if, okay, you want to demonstrate to God that you love him, this isn't about warm, fuzzy feelings or appreciating him who, for who he is. I mean, you might have that anyway, but here Jesus is giving us the criteria to demonstrate that we love God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is how we demonstrate love for God. In fact, if you think about it, this is how we become disciples altogether. Do you remember the Great Commission, Matthew 28? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Everybody's welcome, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God brings them to saving faith, and we baptize them of a re as a reflection of their new commitment. They've died to themselves. They've been buried with Christ. They're rising again to new life. But then look what he says in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all. All that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You want to follow him. What's the task before you? Observe all that I have commanded. What does that mean? 
Well, it means two things. We have to learn what he's commanded, and then we have to obey what he's commanded. This is exactly what Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples in this upper room discourse before he goes to the cross. If you love me, you will what? You will obey me. And look, he says it again here, whoever has my commandments. Now, this is the second time in this same chapter that he says it again. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them. There it is. We keep them. We obey. It's not enough to say you love Jesus and mean that you have warm, fuzzy feelings about him and you feel attracted to him. That's not what God wants. If we're going to love God, we have to obey God. It just follows, right, that the creature does what the Creator commands. And that just makes sense, doesn't it? Well, Jesus is telling his disciples now here for the second time in, his, in just a few verses, if, if you know what I want, I want you to do it, right? What does he say in Luke 6? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? No, his disciples are called to obey. That's what we're called to do. That's how we demonstrate our love. We obey. Now listen to the benefit. We looked at this yesterday. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. That's how we demonstrate our love. Look at the second half of this verse. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Okay, God the Father is paying attention to our response of obedience. And I will love him. Jesus the Son, the second member of the Trinity, is paying attention to our response of obedience and manifest myself to him. The benefit here is just profound. That through obedience to God, what happens? Our relationship with him, through our obedience to his word and what he's commanded, our relationship becomes intimately personal. That he shows himself, that he leads us, that he, he produces his fruit through us. It's, it's phenomenal. And now the passage is going to move forward to bring it even Uh, to another height, another level. Watch this. Uh, In verse 22, we read, Judas, not Iscariot, there was more than one Judas in the group of disciples, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Again, the disciples are trying to understand what he's talking about. They really don't understand this is the last meeting they'll ever have. Although, the Lord has told them a few times that he's going to the cross. They haven't seen him be arrested yet. They're they're trying to figure out what he's telling them. How are you going to show yourself to us and not to everybody else? I mean, you're either here or you're not here. And, and, you know, from a physical perspective, if we can see you, so can everybody else. So how can you just show yourself to us and not to the world? Well, here it comes. This is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. 1423 of John's Gospel, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He will keep my word. There it is again. If anyone loves me. Here's the third time in this passage Jesus is saying to us, You want to show me that you love me? Hey, if you want to have warm, fuzzy feelings and tell me that you appreciate me, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that, but... If you really want to demonstrate your love for me, do what I say. Three times in a row. If he says it once, it has authority. But if he says it three times in the, in, a, in the span of just a few verses, do you think he's trying to emphasize this? I do. I do. And my Father will love him. Well, wait a minute. Let's back up. When he says, keep my commandments or keep my word, I just want to refresh you for a second. Here's a passage that Jesus tells us what he wants. If anyone would come after me, okay, here's what he wants from us. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Do you see that? When you come to Jesus Christ by faith, you're no longer allowed to live in your own self-sufficient, selfish, I want what I want and I'm going to get what I want. No, we deny ourselves. We say it doesn't matter what we want. Our goal in life, now that we belong to Jesus Christ, is to do what he wants. Let him deny himself. What does he want? Take up his cross. Let us give him our lives to the extent that we are willing to die at any moment to show our love for him, if he should so call us to that. Now, maybe he won't. Maybe we'll die in our sleep when we're 100. Okay, 
But nonetheless, our attitude in life has to be, there is no greater love in our lives than our love for Jesus Christ, and we will do whatever he calls us to do. We will take up our cross every day. Even if we have to suffer rejection, we have to suffer the ostracism of the world because we have chosen to obey Jesus instead of follow the world's ways, no problem. We have committed ourselves. This is part of what he wants. This is part of what we are to obey. And do you see it says, and follow me. Jesus is actively alive. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. We are still called to do what he calls us to do in his word and to also allow his spirit to lead us through the circumstances of our lives. When we don't know what to do, we call on him. Lord, lead me, show me, open the right door, help me do everything you've called me to do today that I might glorify your name and bring honor to you while you produce your fruit through me. That's the call of every true believer's heart. He wants us to follow him. And what does he say? For whoever would save his life will lose it. You hold on to your life now. When you get to that judgment seat, you're going to lose your life. Why? Because you lived for yourself. You lived in your own self-sufficiency. You did not surrender your life to Jesus Christ. But who, whoever loses his life for my sake, in other words, I will abandon my self-sufficiency. I will abandon my agenda. I do want to lose my life for you, Jesus. I will do whatever you want me to do. The one that takes life in that direction will save their life. Why? Because when you get to that judgment seat of God, you will be eternally redeemed. You will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You will know that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and you'll serve him forevermore because he's placed his righteousness on you, and you've escaped the judgment of God against evil through the substitution made by his death on the cross. Well, back to our passage. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and think about this. And my Father will love him. Again, we go through the same sequence that we went through in verse 21. In 21, he'll be loved by my Father. Here in 23, my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. I hope you can just get a little thimble's worth of what this is saying. Because it's so absolutely profound. You know, we read in Scripture that the believers are filled with the Holy Spirit, right? He comes to indwell us. 1 Corinthians 3, we are the temple of God. Okay, fantastic. But did you realize that based on John 14, 23, the Trinity, God himself, indwells the believer. We will come to him and make our home with him. <laughs> Talk about never leaving us or forsaking us. Jesus is saying that he and the Father and the Spirit will indwell us. We will have God in us, with us, working through us as we surrender. But do you see the condition? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. This is a relationship that grows out of obedience. This is a relationship where we take him seriously at what he's commanded, and we live our lives to obey him. Critically, critically important to understand, church. This is not just something Jesus does because we said a bunch of words sometime and we have warm, fuzzy feelings. You know, we prayed the prayer and we have warm, fuzzy affection for Jesus. No, no, this intimate relationship and fellowship with God is rooted in obedience, obedience, obedience. How many times can I say it? This is how we show we love God. We obey him. And on the flip side of the coin, we get to 1424, and Jesus says, whoever does not love me. So here's the other side. How do you know you're not loving Jesus? He does not keep my words. Jesus says, look, I want you to live in a certain way. I want you to obey me. I want you to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. This is what I'm commanding you to do if you are my follower. Well, when we live our lives opposite of that, when we say, Jesus, you know, <laughs> my, my whole culture believes in having sex before marriage, so I'm going to go forward with that because I don't want to stand out in the crowd, and I think it's okay, you know. Uh, you don't mind, do you? Well, what are we saying to God? We're saying, God, I don't love you. When, when my whole culture is willing to cheat on their taxes, 
and I want to go along because I don't want to pay the IRS more than I should or more than I'm supposed to. Well, what are we doing? We're telling Jesus we don't love him. When, when we tell that lie to save ourselves from whatever situation we're in, uh, what are we doing? We're telling Jesus, I don't love you. We're disobeying. Now, the Lord has graciously allowed us to receive his forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus knows we will stumble and we will fall, but he is strong enough to pick us up and to restore us. He is strong enough through the cross. His death applies to all our sin, past, present, and future. Nonetheless, if we're going to love God, we have to head ourselves in the direction of doing what God says. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. The magnitude of this passage, God the Father loves us. Jesus the Son is going to manifest himself to us. The Father and the Son are going to make their home with us. And our job stated three times, if you love me, obey me. Church, there's a lot to absorb here. We went pretty fast. If you have questions, please leave them for me in the comments section below. But just meditate on this. You're never alone. The promise of the living Lord Jesus Christ is as you set your sights to obey him day in and day out, to learn what he's commanded and to do what he's commanded, that God himself indwells us. 24-7, from now to eternity, a surrendered life to Jesus Christ has the Lord himself living in us, that we might operate in his power. Oh, <laughs> what a glorious truth. Church, I pray you serve him well today. God bless you.